Well, I'll get started before the slides come up. Um, so I, like Sharon and Craig, were students at the Institute in its early days, and I had Jed, of course, as a professor, as well as Polly and Trevor. Jed examined me twice for my comprehensive exams on the history of physics, where he could throw any question at us from Aristotle to Einstein, and we were expected to answer. And apparently it went well, so after that he was willing to tolerate my interest in the history of economics. So I'm here not as an effect, but as a demonstration of Jed's um, wo really wonderful support of someone who doesn't work in the history of physics. Uh, and I know he still can't quite figure out why or what would possess anyone to work in the history of economics, but um, I just want to say he's been a very supportive mentor to me throughout my career. He also examined me on my thesis. He had me to the Dibner for a sabbatical. He had me here for a, a visiting uh, 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 well, a conference where I gave a lecture. And I also got to know Diana as a young visiting professor, first at Harvard and then here at Caltech. So I really, really always enjoy seeing her, having had those two um, periods where we overlap. So I've just turned in a manuscript that's coming out a year from now with the University of Chicago Press. It's with the copy editor. It's on the economics of David Hume. And so I decided, well, I was given the title of the session on facts, and so I had to think of what, what would fit this. And so I decided, we'll just talk about this small part of the book. And um, it will be the first book on Hume's economics. And it's an interesting fact because he's an extremely influential thinker in the field, um, and yet much of the scholarly attention has gone to the sort of three heavyweights in economics, Adam Smith, Karl Marx, and John Maynard Keynes. So the main work that he issues is the political discourses in 1752, but the reason I list the other works is they also contain a great deal of, of economic uh, theory and, and application. The political discourses, Hume himself says in his autobiography, was the only work that was an immediate success it was reissued in 11 editions in his lifetime, so from 52 to 76. Actually, the last one came out just after he died. 12 translations in Europe. The one translation in French by Leblanc was uh, claimed to be like a novel snatched up. So he was selling thousands, tens of thousands of copies of his economic essays. And everybody uh, essentially uh, looked at these. So. Um, uh, before I get into the details, just to say when Adam Smith starts out as a professor at the University of Glasgow, his first public lectures are on Hume's essays uh, in economics. When Francois Quenet decides to study economics at the ripe age of 57, he reads David Hume. Uh, Malthus looks to Hume's essay on population as a primary resource. Ricardo, when he wants to understand money, he reads Hume, and so on and so forth. In the 20th century, both Milton Friedman and Paul Samuelson have written articles exactly on Hume's economics, and yet for some reason nobody has taken the time to write this book, and it's partly because one has to position his economics in his entire philosophical oeuvre, and that's extremely hard to do because those are each works that have become uh, uh, massive um, tomes and, and require really a labor of a lifetime. So I just want to say that in the, the treatise itself, as you know, he commences with a claim that he's going to form the science of man, the moral sciences, and he wants to find basic laws uh, of the association of the mind, of the mechanics of human agency. He wants to find general truths, truths that are almost as general and certain, as he says, as any of the mathematical sciences. And he is very re, uh, cognizant of the fact that he needs to ascend up from looking at individual uh, phenomena to what we might call the, the, the uh, large data that what arises from a great number may often be accounted for by determined known causes. So again, very interesting mode of thinking that is uh, strikingly original for the time. In his first inquiry, which is a, a repackaging of book one of the treatise, after extolling the uh, results of Newton on astronomy, he asks, can we not also carry out researches still farther and discover, at least in some degree, the secret springs and principles by which the human mind is actuated? I'll skip a little bit. There is no reason to despair of equal success in our inquiries concerning the mental powers and economy. So again, this realization that there's this potential for this science of economics. 
That said, in the 18th century, there are at least 4,000 publications in French alone in the discourse of economics, and in English, about 2,600. So it's a vast literature. People are writing all the time about trade and money and um, markets and interest rates, population. It's a really burgeoning field. But again, he's trying to establish a science of economics. And in that sense, the next quote, that he seeks universal propositions which comprehend under them an infinite number of individuals and include a whole science in a single theorem. A vision that one could say results in being, here being a bit Whiggish in the Slitsky equation or the general uh, equilibrium theory of Arrow and de Brew. One example of Hume's ability to achieve abstract thinking is to establish a new variable in the quantity theory of money that essentially was uh, articulated by Copernicus that the price level is a function of the money supply. But what Hume does is also introduce what we might call gross domestic product or output. It seems a maxim almost self-evident that the prices of everything depend on the proportion between commodities and money. Increase the commodities, I've represented that as the variable y, they become cheaper, increase the money, they rise in their value. So he has a really interesting fact that Insofar as there may be a dramatic economic growth, um, the money has to spread itself over that many more transactions in the marketplace. And as a result, the price level will not rise as uh, quickly as the money supply. And so as a result, although there's always inflation in Europe in the early modern period, he wants to show that in real terms, everything has become cheaper. So everything must become cheaper in times of industry and refinement. And to establish this, here we get to some facts, um, he establishes that since the time of Columbus, the money stock of Europe has increased by a factor of about eight. The price level, he argues, has only increased by a factor of four. So taking, again, you know, rough measure of 250 years from 1500 to 1750, he's able to establish that the gross product of Europe has doubled. Dramatic growth, as we know it to be the case. What are the sources for these estimates? Well, he knows quite a lot about the purchasing power of money, as we'll see in a minute. He knows a lot about the money supply in Europe, and he knows this because of frequent debasements or the recoinage that Newton oversaw in 1696. I got Newton into my talk, hard to do, but possible. Um, and, and here, for example, he says a crown in Henry VII's time, Henry VII, served the same purpose as a pound does at present, so he's able to establish purchasing um, power parity, and a crown, for those who don't know your British currency, was five shillings, so one-fourth. In France, he shows that there's a temporal lag between the influx of money and the rise of prices, and this is where he gets to one of his greatest insights that Milton Friedman will later acknowledge and basically get the Nobel Prize for, is that if you can get money into the system, for Friedman it was the helicopter drop, if you can get money in, sort of it injected into an economy, you can stimulate uh, the growth. So money can have efficacy, if you will, and real growth effects. And Hume thinks this happened in 1715, the last year of Louis XIV's reign, that the money stock rose three-sevenths and the price is only one-seventh. And the reason, again, is because of dramatic growth. He can show that corn, wheat in France, has the same nominal price in 1750 as 1683, he knows a lot about the debasements of the currency. He knows this from someone like uh, the important figure Dutot. And so he's establishing a lot of important metrics that are nascent price indexes, ones that Adam Smith will also adopt. My favorite case in Hume is, it's all in a footnote, but he tries to estimate the cost of the entire Roman army. And he knows that every soldier was play, paid a denarius, and he works out that this is equal to something less than eight pence in 1750 terms. How does he do this? Well, he looks at what average Londoners, unskilled workers, are paid 12 pence, but they wear much better clothing. And he goes into details about the, the quality of clothing and so forth. He knows how many soldiers were in the legions. Actually, the Romans are very good at that. And he knows what officers were paid. And so he works out that the entire bill came to 1.6 million pounds. Now, that's the salary bill. Of course, there's armaments that are needed and so forth. But he also knows with considerable reliability from his good friend James Oswald that the British Navy alone costs 2.5 million pounds. So one of the things he tries to argue, and he develops this in a lot of his work, is that the cost 
of military provisions in real terms has risen dramatically and will continue to rise. And he himself was in the war of the Austrian succession and he works out the budget of what the British were spending uh, at the time. And he realizes that the only way to pay for this is to issue bonds to go increasingly into debt. And he writes three or four moving um, passages about the problem of mortgaging the future through the issuance of bonds. So the public debt is a, a really interesting theme throughout his work. He has lots of data about the size of the money stock in England, Scotland, France, Ireland, Poland, even China. He knows a lot about the purchasing power of the money. He knows about prices and taxes and interest rates and prices. He's just a veritable sponge for data. The more you, re and there's a lot of unpublished Hume that is included this and is just you know uh, replete with ascriptions like 10 million Britons, that there's three million pounds in the crown, there's half a million pounds in Ireland, which actually he questions, but one of his favorite is that there are only 17,000 bondholders in the UK, and so his recommendation for the public debt is to declare bankruptcy. What's 17,000 in the, uh, you know, compared to 10 million people, he argues. He knows that the Chinese average wage is three pence a day, that the Dutch wages are two pence higher than England, that the interest rate in Jamaica is 10 percent, and those are just a, that's just a small sample of his efforts to collect uh, data. He lives in London several times in his life, and if you add it all up, it comes to about five or six years. Um, and while he is in London, he's not only seeing the rise of shop, um, shopping practices, the sort of um, tobacco row, the rows of similar uh, merchandises, but he's also able to read things like the Gentleman's Magazine that includes price charts. Um, the newspapers were increasing rapidly in London and were teaching people about prices and shopping and so forth. So he's in a really burgeoning commercial beehive that you know, other people like Mandeville had also depicted. But he has many other more reliable sources for his data. So Fleetwood's work on money and corn that goes back 600 years, the best source and, of course, the best name in the entire history of economics, Malachi Postlethwaite, um, his Universal Dictionary of Trade and Commerce. Um, we have good reason to think Hume uh, looked at this in 1749-50, just as he was completing his economic essays. The work of Defoe and Swift, who give very detailed accounts of the um, geographical landscape with much economic data. Many of you in this room know the work of the political arithmeticians like Petty and Halley. Davenant and King, the Jesuit travel logs. Hume is uh, always bringing in Greek and Roman data to make comparisons. But above all, the science of commerce that was already developed, and I just list a number of names of figures that he knew and read. So his essays and his correspondence, his unpublished works, just full of these um, bits of data. Um, and the interesting, too, is that as a very young man at age 23, when Hume first left, Scotland, he went to Bristol. He was actually accused of fathering a child, and he had to get out very quickly. But he couldn't also make ends meet, and so he takes up work with a sugar merchant in Bristol, and he's basically an accountant. And um, then when he's hired by General St. Clair to invade France, and they actually do land on the coast of Brittany, and then he goes with General St. Clair um, across uh, to Vienna to settle the War of the Austrian Succession, um, he's doing accounting. I've looked at the St. Clair papers. They became available in the year 2000. And he's having to do all the ship's accounting while, they're, while he's sailing around. And he has very interesting remarks. So, and this is just a sample. Any man who travels over Europe at this day may see by the prices of commodities that money, in spite of the absurd jealousies of princes and states, so the noise, the interference of these individuals, has brought itself nearly to a level and that the difference between one kingdom and another is not greater in this respect than it is often between different provinces of the same kingdom. So implicit in there are notions of variance, market forces that override the noise, the interference of, of, of individual uh, states, people who might want to debase the currency and tamper with it. The money will override that. So there's a sense that money has now a kind of force and autonomy that uh, transcends uh, national um, divisions or, or individual agency. So he develops in his work basically the law of one price, uh, an idea that becomes salient in the work of, say, David Ricardo, that essentially 
there are forces that bring about a uniform profit rate, a uniform wage, a uniform price for any given good. And once you have that, you can develop a really beautiful theory. He has many nascent statistical tools, um, estimates of average wages and prices. He uh, basically embraces the notion of mean reverting tendencies. Um, he adopts the law of large numbers, as I've seen he has uh, appeals to notions of variance. And he also is very keen to bring out correlations in his economics. So a lot of different um, statistical tools that are never given rigor, um, they're just used uh, implicitly. Uh, so he seeks large samples of data, for example, in his essay, Politics is a Science, that we would find instances of this kind and multiply them without number, looking again to antiquity as well as to modern times, foreign as well as domestic. So again, this always strong universal stance that, that he seeks in confirming his economic principles. And in the dialogues, for example, he talks about the millions and millions of such instances about bi biological reproduction. So again, he's never thinking uh, in small terms. We know from Steven Stigler's wonderful book on the history of statistics about the work of John Arbuthnot, and Hume knew this work. And Arbuthnot took 84 years of data about uh, male, female uh, birthing at one London hospital using christening records. Um, he suspected that it, they were not equal, but he took as his null hypothesis that they would be and then established that the probability that this held true was vanishingly small. So it's a really great piece of reasoning, kind of nascent name and Pearson mode of reasoning. Um, I don't think Hume knew about Bernoulli or de Moivre, although de Moivre was in London uh, in the 18th century, but both of them, of course, would have given him a more rigorous um, access to the ways in which one deals with large data sets. But we do see here in some of Hume's quotes a kind of, as I say, an implicit understanding. There's more difference between the prices of all provisions in Paris and Languedoc than between those in London and Yorkshire. Okay, so again, because the commercial uh, development of England was that much the greater, there was increasing convergence of prices and the, the magnetic draw of the London markets. Um, weather patterns, it's more probable in almost every country of Europe that there will be frost sometime in January, then the weather will continue warm throughout the whole month. So this, is probably, this probability varies according to the different climates and approaches to a certainty in the more northern kingdom. So again, he's thinking in a really very uh, interesting manner. He argues that interest and profit rates are correlated. It's extremely hard to see a profit rate. Um, again, companies can do what they want. As we know, airlines usually, or Amazon, post uh, negative uh, <laughs> profits. Um, but interest rates are very easy to see, and this is something Hume recognizes. And he makes a brilliant argument that the two are correlated. Um, it makes no sense for someone to invest their money in a risky venture if they can get a higher return in the bank and vice versa. But his view is that this will bring about a convergence. They won't be identical, but they'll be very close. And he himself was pleased to get 4% on his later purchases of stocks, knowing that he could get 3% in the bank. So he understood that, you know, that there was this already existing convergence. And he talks about the factors that bring this about. and he recognizes, too, that one has to explain the secular decline of interest rates from roughly 10% in Elizabeth I time to 3% in Georgian England. And he has lots of arguments about why that's the case, but most of it has to do with the increasing um, commercialization uh, of, of early capitalism. And he attributes this very much to the habits and customs of people rather than to just the sheer influx of money. So he has a really interesting argument about that. And when it comes to population, and I'll stop here, he has a great deal to say um, about trying to figure out. So his essay on population is over 100 pages long, and it's just chock full of data. He's always trying to work out. Again, he takes as his null hypothesis the position that Montesquieu advanced that the Roman Empire had more people than uh, was the case in Europe. He wants to refute that. And so he does that by, again, showing how improbable that was. Finding data from various sources, uh, positing a geometric rate of growth of, of 25 years, talking about resurgences after plagues and wars, recognizing there are no precise figures on population present or ancient. So everything has to be estimated. He looks at the cost of raising children, notices the patterns of increasing ex 
uh, expense when it comes to London or Paris. Um, and his main point is that population increases with a flourishing economy, and that was certainly widely embraced throughout the 18th century. There was no better indicator in, uh, of a, a prospering region than a growing population. But again, working out data, so a person in England might spend six pence a day, but considers them, themselves poor if they have but 30 pence. He compares sizes of workshops and ateliers. He estimates about ancient Greece having about 1.3 million persons. Same size as Scotland, roughly. So again, he's got measures about um, the, the geographical regions. And he looks at, at other arguments about population size. And this just goes on and on. So this is just a small sample. So just to, to finish up, although he doesn't, of course, have access to proper statistical techniques, least squares, and so forth, um, he's part of a broad movement at the time that is really trying very hard to establish general truths in economics, but to uh, uh, establish them as well with appeals to quantitative data. So I will stop there. Thank you.